I'll talk about machine learning. I was like, mm. that's what I did when I was studying on the university. So, and next to AI, you have a deeper understanding, more techniques on machine learning and deep learning. But let's see how the panelists, what they think about what AI is. Beginning with Anthony? Sure, oh. yeah. Um, to me, AI is that next layer on top of DL and ML, on top of deep learning and machine learning. And I do absolutely agree, some suppliers are promoting AI when it's really not AI they're selling you. It's DL or machine learning. They're not the same thing as AI. To me, AI implies some ability to make independent decisions based on information that's placed in front of you. A great example of that was shown recently when an AI system in the, based in the US, well named names, was using uh, racist opinions on Instagram because it learned those racist opinions from other people on Instagram and thought that was correct. And it started spouting racist information so they turned it off. Uh, that kind of decision making isn't what machine learning or deep learning did. That's an extra layer of coding on top of machine learning and deep learning that helps to make decisions based on the information in front of it. So it's a bit different from ML and DL in that respect. I have a device at home that manages security in my home network that claims to use AI. It's really connecting to a cloud database comparing collected information, heuristic information off my network against what it sees in the cloud database to see if there's any abnormal activity, then takes action based on that, on the router, on this internet router. That's not really AI, that's calling a database of information and making decisions, not necessarily independent decisions, but making determinations based on calculations against that information. It's a different thing to me. I always think of neural networks when I think of AI myself. Yeah. To me, I think it's important to mention, first of all, to also set the scene, there actually is nothing intelligent about artificial intelligence. It all is taking attributes, categorizing them, and then classifying them, or actually the other way. It's first about classifying and then categorizing them. So, um, and I think this is also important when we, when we think about the aspect of uh, AI taking over the world, where we have these scenarios, etc. Maybe one day we're going to be there, but we're not there yet. So AI is, from a technical perspective, using attributes, and that's it. So that, what, what does it mean? Uh, we need a lot of data in order for that it works. And we need the calculation capacity for that we can process it in order to get the results. So for example, self-driving cars in this case, it is all about the sensors, all about the information that's getting in there, it's being processed via machine learning, for example, and uh, then the decision is made based on how this information, how these attributes are categorized based on what the system actually knows. So in, uh, at least on supervised machine learning, it's the way that, uh, and you might have heard of these, these uh, Google car drivers or with Tesla, same story, you have these drivers who actually train the cars. And this is, first of all, to show the algorithm what the actual result should be. So the machine learns from, from the human behavior, and then based on the results, having enough information, they can start to, to drive themselves. So if you, we would have just reckless drivers in these cars, then the, the uh, autonomous cars would just drive recklessly. And this is also, if we transfer this to the business, if we feed the AI with bad information, then we get bad results as well. Goran, your definition? Okay. Of yes, AI? I will come to the basic, uh, because uh, the, what is intelligence? It says that it is uh, achieving some objectives by, by learning. So the key to the artificial intelligence is uh, how to make uh, this learning possible. And uh, uh, it is found that uh, this learning to us, to humans, has become through evolution. So through the evolution, we've learned uh, how to learn, <laughs> mm -hmm. or we achieved this. And uh, for example, there is one uh, research from the Michigan State University where they've made the uh, environment, they've made a simulation 
in which machines are learning based on these three basic rules of uh, competition, of uh, mutation, and for, uh, of inheritance. And now they can uh, go through the history because this history could not be found in the, in the fossils. It doesn't exist there. They are doing what was uh, made in the, to, through the centuries and through the millennials in uh, hours, days, and things like that. And through this, they found uh, they, they, uh, the, the main objective is that uh, they will learn how uh, we uh, succeed in this learning and uh, they can uh, make this algorithm usable for the artificial intelligence. So, on the end, uh, uh, what is most important uh, that should be mentioned in, uh, is that, the, uh, for me, the pure artificial intelligence is uh, when this learning is not constrained by the supervision or semi-supervision and training, but when the uh, machine and artificial intelligence achieve this learning by itself. And uh, if we constrain this uh, learning process, then we will make the impact that will be not pure artificial intelligence. And uh, based on this definition, there are many risks that will come later on when we will discuss about the risks. Uh, but uh, also I must mention that uh, uh, there are some other uh, researches like creating a, uh, artificial intelligence without limitations imposed by human design, because mainly we are uh, mimicking what uh, the human design is made and how, and these uh, researches are also interesting. Yes, thank you. So now you are very clear what artificial intelligence is, of course. <laughs> so we continue. <laughs> now. So what you see is what we believe artificial intelligence to be is like a machine that acts like a human being. So we don't see that yet. So we have subforms like machine learning and deep learning. But that brings me to the next question is, looks like a security operating center. Now almost all uh, security monitoring software says they are AI based. But are they truly AI-based? I think Anthony already said something about, yeah, is that truly AI? Because he has stuff at home as well. But what are the current trends in AI? And how does AI help information security in its defense of the business or the organization? Mm. Yeah, um, you can go on Google right now on your phones and Google Google AI. Has anyone looked at Google AI yet? No? Oh, you're not alone, I guess. Google's experimenting in AI right now. You really should look at it, though, because uh, they're taking machine learning and they're trying to take it to the next step. Google's AI platform, they, they predict or they want it to become a new standard in AI technology. I think based on the data collection that, it, that Google undertakes at this point in time, they could certainly build an AI because they have enough data to populate a human brain completely. Um, and they're not shy about saying that they're collecting data all the time when you're online and using Google. So Google AI is in the business. AWS is in the business. Amazon claims to have an AI interface, AI engine as well, running in some of their architecture. Uh, IBM, of course, using AI in their big blue platforms. And then my little home router system by Asus claims to be an AI, although it's really machine learning. But where I see all this leading is into two main categories. Is something happening now. Um, is everyone familiar with adaptive networks? It's a new way to secure a network. Layering layers of firewalls and routers and ACLs and trying to secure your infrastructure that way is getting old school. The new way to do it is making your network adaptive. So it changes configuration based on current situations and patterns. Uh, Fortinet is doing products like this right now and deploying them. I think all the major network and firewall manufacturers are engaged in it as well. I know Cisco is. I was talking to a Cisco rep uh, a couple of weeks ago about this very idea. Adaptive networking means you don't have a whole room full of network staff sitting there waiting for something to break or waiting for someone to say, we've got to secure this better because instead the network sees the issues and it makes the changes and shifts the connections and changes the configurations based on current conditions within the infrastructure. It's very hard as a hacker to defeat that because you have to be faster than the system that's adapting to you. 
It's adapting to what you're doing to it, which feels more human. Because if you go to punch a guy in the face, he's going to try to move his head out of the way, right? That's what boxers do. They don't stand there and wait to be hit, unless you're Apollo Creed or someone, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you don't wait for the hit. As you know, it's coming. You move. This is what adaptive networking does. I think that's the next uh, version of AI that's most useful in current technology situations for IT, for cybersecurity. But then there's uh, threat defense automation, which is a, another layer on top of adaptive networking. With threat defense automation, you have tools built by like SOC manufacturers, and these do predictive analysis on threats, and then adjust your, your security settings specifically within your infrastructure to adapt to known or predicted threats that are coming out. Um, if you have a threat that's been identified as a, an issue in an OS, the, your threat detection system will download that information and apply it before you can read the article about it as a human being. It'll already be in place. You don't have to worry about it. It's already done. So to me, those are the two biggest areas I see the practical application of AI happening within the realm of cybersecurity. What's cool? I think those are very good examples. And uh, in order to think about how AI can help with cybersecurity, we probably need to see what the challenges actually are today. And this is what, what you stressed already. Um, it's uh, first of all about the detection. Do I know whether somebody is in my network, for example? Um, we have these SOC centers, that, uh, like security operation centers, that look for anomalies that uh, kind of uh, create an incident in the case something really is in there. But it's humans mainly. Well, meanwhile, they also use the software, but fair enough. In, in principle, it's yeah, about we do not use the technology to the extent yet as AI could, could support us there as well. So it's about detection, um, and this on, on different levels. So you have the, the, the detection on, on the firewall, where it's then about the rules, et cetera, but it's also about the detection of anomalies within the network, access, uh, suspicious excesses, et cetera, that um, a human just could not oversee at all. In, to the extent of maybe a, a big company, for example. So from a detection perspective, it, it's important, but also from a reaction perspective, AI can help a lot. Um, in terms of that the AI uh, is way more responsive, maybe based on the correct information, can close ports, can disconnect clients that are affected by a virus, for example, directly from the network. Um, based on patterns, based on, on, on the information that is fed into the eye uh, beforehand. And um, then, of course, there's, it's another aspect when it then comes to restoring. But as far as I know, this is not yet there. Um, more intelligent restoring. Like if you have backups, for example, you had an incident and you need to fall back to a previous status, uh, if it is a virus or if it is a ransomware that maybe is, was sleeping within your environment, you probably would not know to what state you have to get back. Because if it was in your network, let's say, 100 days ago, and you go back to the back, uh, backup of uh, last week, then it's still in your network and you still yep. go for it. On the other hand, using AI, the AI understands the signature once it had seen what happens, so it can then react to, to this. That's one of the benefits for the detec detection again. Goran, what do you see? Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, but first I will start with the, these defense strategies. We can make a parallel with the physical world uh, defense strategies from the walls, uh, castles, and things like that, and how they've moved today, and uh, make the parallel with uh, this uh, digital world uh, where is our perimeter at the moment? What we are protecting? What is the most important asset that we should protect? Information. <laughs> yes, uh, it is a partly information, but these are the identities. Mainly with this proliferation of the devices uh, and uh, users that are included, uh, the attack surface is uh, becoming evident on this uh, protecting the identities of the endpoints and of the users. So in these uh, uh, cases, uh, there is a defense uh, strategies uh, that are based on the artificial intelligence that are called like zero trust security. 
So we should not uh, any more trust to our identities that we, even us, mm -hmm. that we have on our endpoints. And we can be uh, fished or somehow misused in some cases as uh, users. And the battle is taking place uh, at this uh, perimeter at the moment. So the application of, uh, of artificial intelligence in this case is uh, that uh, we are using the tools that can uh, uh, monitor uh, the behavior, our behavior, and they can predict that whether we are the one who is appearing on this endpoint, mm -hmm. and whether this identity is ours or these uh, credentials are ours, and protect us in that way. So even this uh, theory comes to the point that we will have uh, passwordless future. Unfortunately, we must admit that we didn't succeed to, to how to make strong passwords and how to remember them. <laughs> and uh, they are the weakest point at the moment. And uh, uh, for, the, for the point that was made on the, on the protecting these infrastructures by using the artificial intelligence, it happens uh, the opposite, that uh, there is an evidence from uh, Cap Capgemini that uh, uh, the hacking organizations are using uh, artificial intelligence for attacking with spare phishing. So they attack with artificial intelligence and we will come to the moment that, of course, these arguments that human cannot... Uh, computer versus computer, right, Corin? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we will come to the situation that artificial intelligence will fight art, uh, against the artificial intelligence because they are quite, quite uh, successful in this uh, example. And uh, uh, security analysts are overwhelmed. And they are not good uh, in the detection, so this uh, security operations center maybe will have only the machines Eventually. that will uh, fight against the machines. Additionally, you know the sentence that the attack is the best defense. So uh, there is a research on the uh, MIT, Lincoln Laboratory, has developed the uh, software based on artificial intelligence that is going on the dark web and collecting the information about the identities and comparing them with the uh, identities that appear on the surface web. And through this, they can discover the attackers. So they can find the identities uh, of uh, attackers in the, uh, at the moment or in the future. So this attack strategy is possible with, with artificial intelligence also because uh, uh, I think that uh, if we, we, we should move uh, the perimeter even further, not to these identities, but to prevent the attack before they happen. Thank God more for the more. dark web, right? Thank God for the dark <laughs> web. The fools are putting it out there for us to find. That's <coughs> okay. So the dark web actually has use. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It does. So what I hear now is that we see an operating center with a lot of people, and in principle, AI should be able to replace all those people. So actually, that will become a black box, and we don't have the beautiful screens and all the people looking at those screens, but the system should be able to defend itself. And then what becomes even worse is that also the criminals will have a system without people behind them that is going to attack our system, and then we get something like Armageddon and <laughs> Good Apocalypse, and we have what Terminator 2 already has, like years ago. <laughs> but joking aside, what you do see is a further integration between what's human, what's cyber, what's digital. So having said all that, what AI is, what ML, DL is, the things that are being done now, what could AI, or what should AI provide the information security business in the future, or in the near future? What can it bring us? Does that mean if the machine, or the people behind the machines are all replaced, then we have reached the optimum of AI? Mm. Or where is it going? Do you have an idea? That's yeah. Um, the iOS, if you haven't looked at it yet, maybe you should. They've got uh, 12 new standards they're creating for artificial intelligence. Has anyone looked those over yet? Looked over the discussion groups? No? Fascinating reading for a Sunday night if you can't fall asleep. Um, 
Yeah, they're not exciting to read some of these standards, but they're covering all the topics from the social impact of AI all the way down to actually using it as a functional tool in IT and in security. So these topic areas being covered in these 12 core standards uh, tell me what the future of AI could look like. For certain, and I agree with Goran and I had, had a big debate about this on the phone when we were getting ready for the conference. He was saying you can't stifle creativity in AI because then you stop it learning. I agree with that, but I also think that every child needs a parent. You have to guide it into development, right? If you don't, you have anarchy. Um, so there has to be some kind of guidance, I think, around the way AI is going to evolve. You can't just say, let's just see what we can do, because that's never a good result with human beings. Human beings, if they're left to their own devices and do whatever they think they need to do at that moment, usually results in a poor scenario. So I think there has to be some kind of structure around it. And there is uh, currently uh, a push to try to standardize the approach to using AI in the future. From a cybersecurity point of view, uh, AI against AI, absolutely right, I agree 100%. That's probably gonna be the future because humans against humans, when it comes to computers being in the middle, it isn't fast enough. The defense isn't fast enough, the attack isn't fast enough. There's always countermeasures against the measures. With AI to AI, at least you're letting the computers fight amongst themselves and you can go home for the day. You don't have to sit there <laughs> and wait. Uh, <laughs> But seriously, the, the use of AI, I think, is going to be in that, that adaptive defense, intelligent countermeasures, and proper real-time monitoring. Instead of waiting for the human to get that alert on their watch or their phone that, yet yeah, there's a breach in progress, it's already taken care of because the systems have seen it and detected it and acted against it. I don't think any of that can be done without human supervision, though. Um, this is, it, I don't think that's, that's a realistic idea. I think there's always going to be a human somewhere in the loop to keep it honest and keep it functional. Pascal? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, regards to the future that it's going to be machine against machine. Um, on the other hand, uh, to get there, also to, to improve AI from where it is today, um, I, I mentioned supervised learning before, where it is about that the machine learns from a human, from a behavior, understanding um, what the attack looks like, which means in the end that at least there has to have been, has to have been one successful attack before. Right. It does not necessarily have to be your company. It might have been somebody else's company because the information may be shared from the tool perspective, like if, if a vendor uses the, the big database of patterns, etc., or the algorithm in the end, um, to share it for all, for all their clients, and everybody benefits from, from, from what's happening. Um, but there's the other aspect, that's the unsupervised learning. And that is basically currently still very much limited from the, from the resources we have, because it takes a lot of computer power, a lot of, a lot of uh, space. Uh, unsupervised learning is basically we don't define what the computer or what the AI has to look for, but the AI analyzes practically everything and then identifies patterns itself. Which is then, if the, if the AI starts to identify what the pattern is and, and sees, hey, this actually might be an issue or something happens here and in relation something happens there and this happened every three weeks, it might get suspicious. So the idea is for, of, the, of the unsupervised learning that the AI detects patterns and uh, currently probably rather goes then to a human to analyze it further. In the future probably then takes its own decisions on, on how to handle it, which is great for us because we need less uh, headcount in the security operation centers. Uh, on the other hand, um, who knows how the AI decides. Because uh, as beautiful as the algorithm is, nobody really understands what the AI does. And that's quite an issue, especially when it comes to business continuity, for example. Um, if the, the AI decides to shut down your operations for whatever reason, um, then you have an issue, although probably nothing happened. And uh, this is going into the threat aspect, but I see a lot of potential in there as well, like a rather autonomous AI uh, aspect for, for the future. To get there, it takes a lot of uh, time, but um, uh, the more we get these uh, 
get the AIs uh, running, the more patterns they identify, the more it evolves uh, as well. So it improves itself. Uh, and another aspect that, that uh, will help is uh, the combination of different AIs. So, so vendors working together against the same threat, actually, the, the, the bad guys, helping each other, sharing, or maybe creating an, an AI on top of existing AIs that's even more intelligent than the existing AI uh, solutions that are in place to, to share, the, share the results. And uh, yeah, I think this is, this is where in the future, no doubt we will see way more AI in, in cybersecurity and cyber defense because also the attacks get more and more so we can't even cope with the, with the size. Um, but also from a technology perspective, it, it will definitely go into this direction. Okay. Warren? Yes, thank you. Uh, so this uh, story about machine up, up, uh, against the machine, it goes further. They say, okay, let's do the wars like this. We will declare the war between the countries and the machines will fight and then they will announce which one has won and the war will stop here. here. <laughs> so this is a true story, but uh, now regarding the, uh, it could be used in future. Now, uh, regarding the, how the artificial intelligence uh, can contribute uh, to uh, the businesses, uh, I think that uh, we've seen many examples of uh, cost effectiveness, of performance improvement uh, in managerial terms. Mm -hmm. And I have one research where the 8,500 uh, executives uh, for, from the regulated industry have been uh, uh, asked and 20% of, uh, of them are uh, CEOs, C Chief Information Officers, and 10% are CISO. And they say that 60% uh, the of them says that uh, they cannot detect, uh, all, they cannot already detect the breach without uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the other result uh, is that 48% uh, of them say that uh, the budgets for artificial intelligence and cybersecurity will be increased in the 2020 for 30%. The other results are, uh, uh, say, says that 69% uh, of enterprises believe that I will be necessary to respond to uh, cyber attacks. 73% uh, they say that they are testing the use cases for artificial intelligence across their organizations. And uh, they are concentrated to what Pascal has uh, noted to the uh, detection, prediction, and even response. Not uh, uh, correction, but response to some attacks. Uh, I will mention here also the possibility that uh, uh, using the uh, AI-based uh, uh, tools, uh, can, they can be used for other products that are made uh, on the basis on the artificial intelligence because the, the problem here is that uh, also uh, the tools that are based on artificial intelligence and are used in other industries, uh, they should provide the security. And uh, for example, I will just mention one, one example. You know uh, what are the flash uh, on, the, on the exchange Stock exchange. There, there are flash uh, drop downs on the on the stock exchange, because seventy percent of the uh, trading that is made uh, is made by the machines, and uh, without knowing the reason, uh, it happens twice in 2010 and 2013 mm -hmm. that this versus has uh, yeah. for several minutes fell down yep. to some uh, one dollar for stock or something yep. like that because the machines have made the wrong assumptions. And uh, in these uh, cases, uh, we should uh, put the security, we should put some another, because uh, it was found that in 2013, this algorithm has been misused by one trader to produce this mm -hmm. and then to take the, the benefits. Yes, reap the benefits. Yes. So we hear what it should bring, what it could bring, but does it then end mm -hmm. here? Is artificial intelligence going to survive mankind before it gets that far? Let us discuss about, so what should we do now? So we talked about what it is, what we have, what we're going to have,
but you guys need to do something about it tomorrow. So what do we need to do now? What's our next step? And then after that, there's some time for questions. So if the microphone can be prepared. Anthony? So I'm, a, I'm an old time fan of Isaac Asimov. Has anyone read his writings? He didn't just write science fiction, you know. He was a respected uh, bio, or physical chemist, but also a respected researcher in science. A very intelligent man. But he invented the three laws of robotics. Everyone's probably heard of those by now. Who hasn't heard of the three laws of robotics? What in the world? <laughs> Get out. No. Uh, you know the three laws are based on the fact, uh, are based on the premise that robots or artificial intelligence are not allowed to harm humans. That's the core of the three principles. No harm to humans are allowed, or allowed to be allowed. Um, so I think that the guidance, for example, the, the, definitely the iOS isn't building those three laws, but they're building a set of standards to help guide artificial intelligence development and use, not just development. And as we all have heard in the last couple of years, the UN has come out in favor of saying you can't use fully robotic war systems against other nations. Um, and by the way, Russia just launched an autonomous robot to the space station and brought it back to Earth again. It flew the rocket itself and performed tasks up there all by itself, didn't need a connection to anything, brought it back home again. <laughs> Not to make you scared, but to me that makes me a little jumpy because they also showed a video of that thing shooting a pistol at a shooting range and hitting the target every time. In any case, um, I think there have to be controls around AI. Let's continue. <laughs> yeah, there have to be controls around AI. Uh, but the, IO, the ISO standards coming, I think, are going to help a lot with that, and I think they've helped a lot in other industries, so I'm sure it's going to assist with the development. Research has to continue and has to be allowed to generate new ideas, but there have to be controls, have to be some kind of guidance. So I think the guidance provided by ISO would be a good start. I think also the um, responsible use of, of artificial intelligence by nation states, not to use it as an attack venue to harvest information from your neighbors when you shouldn't be taking it. Uh, I think international agreements like that should be in place as well because that would slow down at least some of the attacks using artificial intelligence, I think. Um, I've seen nation state attacks in progress and fought against a few of them when I was in the lottery business. And uh, when they're sponsored, they're far more effective because you're fighting an entire building full of people, not just one hacker in his basement anymore. It's, it's a much more difficult fight when you're in that kind of a, a trench war and insecurity. So I think that those controls and those agreements, kind of like the ballistic missile agreements of the past, are a good idea as well. I think for now, I, I agree with the Asimov rules, but um, I for now don't really see how a standardization like with the isonorms, et cetera, will help with the improvement of, of, uh, of uh, AI. Uh, it might help with regards to the ethical aspects on making sure that we, that we follow certain rules, but in the end, especially state-driven, I would uh, assume that uh, rules are to be broken. <laughs> So uh, no. therefore, and usually most of the attacks nowadays still are state-sponsored, um, although there's a big economical aspect in there, which actually overlaps with the states, of course. So therefore, they probably don't really care about the, about the, the rules. So therefore, also from a defense perspective, uh, I don't really see a lot of need and, and benefit for this, for this kind of uh, standardization. Going back to what we should do now, and this is also related to AI, but I think way more important with regards to, to cyber attacks and cyber risk management is uh, first of all to implement, and there's still so many companies that don't have it properly installed, implement tools that help you identify the attacks. Identify if there's anything in your, in your network that might harm. Because in the end, if you don't detect it, you spread the, the malware even further to, to other companies. So it's, it's always still about the detec detection, uh, response, and then for your own company, the, the resilience aspect. And in all these areas, we can use AI now to uh, currently not replace people, but to at least improve the way we work and support people. Because the AI nowadays can go through so many more uh, data points, so much more information than a human could ever do. So we are way more responsive and uh, in the end, therefore, protect our, our environments uh, way better. 
Gorn? Okay, yes. Now back to, to standardization. From that time that we've discussed <laughs> this, I've tried to find some researchers that, whether this is happening, because it will happen firstly on the universities. And I found a record uh, from the University of Bonn and Cologne that they are drawing an inspection cat catalog for certification of artificial intelligence applications. Mm -hmm. That is exactly that, what That's we are perfect. looking for. Yep. And uh, here, the, uh, even one uh, German federal office for information security, BSI, is uh, included. But they say that close dialogue between the fields of information technology, philosophy, and law is necessary. Mm -hmm. So now, except the lawyers, we have uh, philosophers also here. That's good. That's good. <laughs> and they are trying to, to define the properties of these standards, because every standard is uh, based on some keyword like service or information mm -hmm. or something else. And they say, what are the properties? Fairness, transparency, autonomy, uh, data protection, safety, corrigibility. This is like, uh, I, I can say, stop to behave like right. artificial intelligence, <laughs> they said. <laughs> then uh, security and reliability. So still many, many properties and many different disciplines. And uh, again, uh, it comes to these principles. So it is not clear, maybe this uh, inspection catalog will come mm -hmm. in some two to three years. But at the moment, we are still at the Isaac Asimov rules. Yep. The second one is uh, obey to the human if it is not in contradiction with the first one. Right. And the third one is uh, that uh, uh, you can protect yourself if uh, it is not against the first and the second. Exactly <laughs> right. But even Isaac Asimov has put in his stories many, many scenarios in which these principles are failing and uh, it right. is not clear how they will function. So. Uh, Coming to this beginning, uh, that uh, unconstrained learning that have, uh, Pascal has mentioned, unsupervised, uh, is uh, having one problem that uh, we cannot anymore put the controls within the algorithm, because in that case, we will constrain the learning process. And now it comes that uh, the tools that we are telling verification, that ask, did I build the system right? based on some specification, are not more working anymore. Only the validation will work. Did I build the right system? But we can see that through some period of time. Not immediately, because we must uh, leave the artificial intelligence to learn, to learn un in an unconstrained uh, way. And here we have uh, something that is already called, like uh, a term it is used, singularity. This comes from Big Ben. Then say, they say that when this uh, artificial intelligence will make a breakthrough, it will happen in hours, maybe in days. And from that point ahead, we don't have any control anymore over this artificial intelligence that has been uh, produced. And uh, what will happen after intelligence explosion happens, we don't know. That is the main risk. Uh, in this, uh, it may decide place. it doesn't want to work for you anymore and it just wants to read books all day. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> That's the good scenario. <laughs> and uh, I will mention just uh, another, uh, uh, how, how now the standards uh, are developing. They are, uh, they are saying that uh, the controls will be based on the goals because the goals are outputs from this uh, learning process and we can constrain the goals. But again, this hierarchy of goals, like in the Isaac Asimov, these three rules or goals, are not clear. And uh, we should uh, somehow implement uh, these uh, goals uh, uh, into the artificial intelligence to learn, to adapt to our goals through the time, and to retain on these goals. And on the end, I will mention the, the example of uh, Stanislav Petrov, you know, this guy had some 30 years ago or 40, it happens a few days ago. Uh, yep. uh, he decided not to activate the Russian missiles against five missiles that are coming to Russia and that were, uh, that were confirmed that there are uh, some missiles that uh, will attack the Russia. And uh, he said that I was having an instinct. Mm -hmm. 
I was having the instinct that this is not attack, because if it is attack, then they will not attack us with only five muscles. So he decided in a few seconds not to activate the counterattack, and in this case, counterattack would be complete attack, <laughs> and uh, to stop the Third World War. I, I am questioning what would be happened if we put artificial intelligence to decide based on this because of the time frame that we have. Maybe we will be in challenge in the future to do this, but this instinct is still not something that could be introduced to the machines and, and many other, and even on many a other network, consciousness right? and many other. Even on a computer network, you may have a user guessing their password multiple times. You don't want the AI uh, software saying, hey, that guy's attacking and cut him off the network forever. It may just be an honest mistake. Uh, yes, but there are many, now in Passwordless uh, uh, security framework, uh, there are many other parameters that are used. So there is a uh, space of uh, characteristics that are monitored to decide whether this identity is mine or not. Right. And uh, Those are called yeah. rules. Yes. <laughs> I, I just want to want to stress one aspect with regards to these rules and the ethical aspects. Um, there's a request um, from a risk perspective, as well as like uh, there was this case where I think you mentioned it, where like the women were in the uh, in the recruiting process were not as preferred as as men, for example. So the the need is there, or the request is there to open the decision process of the AI. It actually is possible. It takes a lot of uh, calculation power. Um, in principle, it is possible. But actually, with regards to cybersecurity, it's very counterproductive. Because if you open the decision process of how the, the AI defends your environment, it's not just you who can buy the software of, of, the, of the defense person. The attackers have the same software. The attackers have the software, they use the software, they test the software for what is the best way of attacking. If we even open to them like how the how this, this decision mechanism works, then it's much easier for them to to circumvent the the, the defense in that case. For me, I, I haven't yet seen a computer that I've got my hands on, a laptop or a desktop computer, even an, a tablet that doesn't work a way that I expect it to work. I don't expect this thing to start making toast for me or pouring my coffee. I don't think it's going to drive my car tomorrow. It's not made for that purpose. It has specific parameters around it, yet still, this is one of the most creative devices invented by human beings in this century. It's a very intelligent design. It wasn't restricted by the rules placed around its functionality. Its functionality was to do a specific task to perform computing for humans. Those rules didn't stop it from doing something new it still does something new, and it's a new product. So I think that putting in structures around AI, and if you look at those ISO standards, they're not restrictive. They're not saying you can't do this, you must do this. They're more guidance, just like the ISO standard for security, 27001, is not pedantic. It's guidance. You can do a lot more with your security than what's in 27001, and I'm certain in these 17,000 series standards for AI, you'll be able to do a lot more with AI than what these standards say, but you'll still have a platform to start from that'll be common, and it'll be trusted, and it'll be vetted by professionals and experts. One of my friends from Serbia in Belgrade, respected researcher, author, works at university, works full-time at the same time, teaches, works in AI. He's on one of the committees for these ISO standards. I trust that he's gonna put the right stuff in there to not restrict AI development. He's a big proponent of AI, but I know what he contributes is going to help put a platform in place where you'll have rule sets that'll be common. So maybe bring that to you guys. So you've heard the definition, what we do in the future. Can the microphone go to Michael, please? Uh, so do you have any remarks, questions? Hi, Michael Redmond. Kind of a long little bit of question here, but just to, and I agree, you know, it certainly has changed. When I was in my early 20s, I was a technical recruiter for AI. The questions I had to ask, the questions I had to know to be able to do this were quite limited. Now you got into Python. Much when Python developed, mm -hmm. not to where it should be, but it's still developed. Mm -hmm. 
I was taking, um, I, I have other life besides taking courses, but people don't know that. <laughs> two, two years ago, I said, oh, I have some free time, so I decided to go for my master's courses at uh, Rochester and Shoes Technology in AI and machine learning. I said, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't done anything this week. So I went to the classes, and what's interesting is we just started talking about the technology of it and such, and then the questions were, because it's a cybersecurity master's, and I had no intention except taking the classes I wanted. Uh, and the questions we had were the ethical questions, but also the cybersecurity questions about how do we keep up better than the hackers. I have a client that I am meeting with uh, next Wednesday. They are a... Uh, medical device company. And mm -hmm. I've done disaster recovery for medical devices in the past. I did uh, 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 disaster recovery for the heart monitors. Last year, we're not the cybersecurity. What happens when the heart monitor's in someone's body and it doesn't work? How do we do a disaster recovery plan for that? And I had to come up with solutions. Kind of critical. So, very, but here, and you know, so I did disaster recovery for when your GPS doesn't work and it's taking you off the cliff. So we had all of that for General Mills and such. Now, they, uh, last year, there was the artificial intelligence, or the machine learning, actually, uh, they found out was hackable. Mm -hmm. And they had to remove pacemakers from many, many patients. The disaster recovery would have worked. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah. But the, and part of the disaster recovery we had done was how to, with the doctors, how to safely remove, how to replace. Right. So we had that plan, God, that was still, hopefully they developed the plans since I did it. But th they were hacked. Uh, there was a uh, AI, not more machine learning, but uh, there were pacemakers, not pacemakers, uh, monitors, heart monitors, that were changed on one particular patient for whatever reason. Mm. And they were tracking different pacing on it. So you didn't realize that the person was att having an uh, attack because it was showing normal, and this was in one, one hospital. So what's happening is I'm meeting with a medical device company, and uh, they are, uh, and I just on a minor level, because I have not done the uh, ISO in the AI, but about what risk do they have what if it is attacked? Right. What risk do they have? How could they do it from, not from a technical point of view, they'll bring somebody else in for that aspect, so because my Python is basic, you know, certainly not the person you want in there coming in doing that, but what if the uh, coder didn't uh, have the best intentions? And when my daughter was in school, she, had, she was doing, uh, she's a data scientist and uh, uses, designs AI based on her thinking process and manually codes. Right, right. But her thinking process, it's, so it will be thinking the way she thinks. I said, what if somebody doesn't agree with the way you think? Should they're stuck. So my question is, with all of this here, two, three questions. One, how do we control who we're bringing in to do the designs so that to make sure that they have the best intentions when we're hiring the people? That's the first question. The second question is, how do we do the cybersecurity aspects of it before we design it, mm -hmm. not after? And the third question I'd like to present is, uh, when our best efforts have failed and we have been attacked, for instance, our SIM software, us, uh, uh, cyber incident event management software today, many of them are creating many false positives, mm -hmm. causing firms tremendous downtime. Where it's supposed to be saying you're being attacked, people are coming in, the incident response teams are coming in, lo and behold, they're false positives because it's still requiring manual correlation to set up the rules properly. Yeah, but right. people aren't being taught that when they buy the softwares. Right. So, four <laughs> questions. How do we educate the consumers <laughs> also? So I'm almost done. <laughs> How do we educate the consumers on choosing the right software so that they're not listening to the marketing teams, but understanding if the machine learning actually is working positively because the statistics are not out there. No. These companies that are having false positives are not reporting them. Right. I right. know it because I'm helping my clients choose. Right. But the point is, it doesn't most, it's not out there for most people. Then the, the last question was, how do we help design it in such a level that we keep the ethical realms to it so that we are making sure that we're not going beyond what we choose to do, but it misinterprets our wording. I don't know if you ever saw the old movie uh, called uh, The Bathtub, uh, yeah. the, uh, the, uh, hot the Hot they Tub. They go back yeah. in time and... Uh, yeah about future and then there's a, uh, a car and the car was told that if someone is not a good person, 
to uh, not con let them continue. It meant on the ride. So the car is trying to con kill the person because it was programmed, or, and now it's gone in, past machine learning. Right. And it's it misinterpreted, and they kept saying through the whole movie, they really needed to get the language better. <laughs> so <laughs> how do we deal with those issues? I know there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. So I know, I know. If you can but, pick a few and answer. Be, I'm not going to be in front of have, you again, so I'd like yeah. to get all my answers if I can. And <laughs> we thank we you are all for your between lunch, so I know a lot of people want to leave. If you can give a quick, a quick answer. <laughs> yes, with the last questions, you guess uh, something that is very important for the artificial intelligence, because uh, there are problems uh, not about uh, uh, how, but why. This why is, in many cases, uh, connected with uh, ethical aspects. And in many cases, the artificial intelligence is making assumptions that are wrong. Like with this uh, flash crash, flash crash on the uh, stock exchange. So, uh, uh, for the question who should develop this uh, and uh, on what et ethical uh, basis, uh, there is a uh, paper that is signed by the, by the researchers thousands of them, that they will not work uh, uh, the tools with artificial intelligence that will harm the people and that will be used in the war or something like that. So uh, for the other questions, I think the, the main problem is still that we cannot uh, uh, make the design of the artificial intelligence in a way that we will constrain the learning process. And from here, the most of the risks are arising. So we must leave it free to make the decisions, to make the choices, and then see what are the results. That's a good ending for me to summarize. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. So what we talked about is the definition. So learning how to learn. Uh, we talked about being adaptive, which is the current state. But what we want is that it becomes independent. And then it will be the question, do we want to do it supervised, unsupervised? Talked about a child needing a parent to grow up before we let it go. And then we ended up with actually it will be a mix of multiple disciplines like law, philosophy, IT, ethics, and all that. And we should look at the why more than the how. So I want to ask the panelists to give a final word in a few seconds to what's the general takeaway. The takeaway for me is we need to make a choice. Either we take away the constraints and let it bloom completely, or do we want to do it gradually? But let's see, Anthony. Yeah, I think AI is like the uh, modern version of the huckster up on the stage selling you that magic potion. And all the while they're playing you a little tune on the banjo, trying to trick you and say, yeah, drink this stuff, you'll feel better. And it's just a bunch of alcohol and cocaine mixed together. Um, <laughs> AI, yeah, you should watch those old westerns. That's what really they're, they're selling you. Um, AI really isn't there yet, and it's still in development, obviously. That's why you hear a lot of research talk around it, a lot of, lot of university-type research on it, because it isn't mature. It isn't real yet. It's still machine learning and deep learning with a little bit of algorithm landed on top of that, so it's not independent. Um, but when it does get there, I think standardization and some kind of platform to base your decision making on when you're building this stuff is important. Coding today is based on the same thing. Every device you have that's, that's got electronics in it, that's based on standardization. If I go out tomorrow and start building my, my processor chips for my new computer out of carpeting off the floor, I can guarantee you no one's going to buy it. It'll burst into, into flame the first time you plug it in. So there's standardization for these things all the way along. And it's it's yielded fantastic results, creative results. And I don't think there's any problem whatsoever with standardizing AI, at least at a base level. Then let the creativity flow off that base. Let's go. Yeah, despite the exaggerating marketing. <laughs> um, and yeah, I agree, AI can't keep up with, with it. Uh, but on the other hand, I think AI is already in a stage where it can help a lot. I think we still, and we should use it. Um, I think we still need to be aware of that AI is not a replacement of a human thinking person, etc. It has its limitations, but we can use AI to the extent that it's, that it's available today. And it keeps on evolving. And uh, therefore, I think also in the future, 
especially with regards to cybersecurity. On both sides, there will be a lot more use of, uh, of uh, AI in, in cyber. Gorn? Okay, yes, on the end, uh, I will say, uh, first, uh, you see that uh, what, we, what, we, uh, what topic we are dis discussing now are mainly ethical principles of artificial intelligence. And uh, this is uh, uh, based on the friendly, making the friendly AI uh, and uh, the theory behind this. But uh, uh, for the end, I, I will say that artificial intelligence as a creative industry should uh, develop unconstraints of this uh, standardization. It is not possible on the level of the principles only. <laughs> it is possible. I, I, I would say agree to disagree. <laughs> uh, let's not let uh, perfect to be enemy of good. Yeah. So we should continue with the, this development before we find uh, the perfect solution for this problem and the risk that it puts on table. Okay. Thank oh, I want to thank the panelists for telling us the effects of AI on information security. Thank you very much. <laughs>